children's literature, a publishing category that emerged in the Victorian period to exploit a specialized market, is both simpler and less conventionally realistic than adult literature, even while traditionally restricted in its materials. Looser constraints on style and invention invite the fantastic. As we examine works by Beatrix Potter, Margaret Wise Brown, Dr. Zeus, and Norton Juster, we see, though, that simpler has some quite specific implications for character, plot, theme, and style. In addition, children's literature has a visual component absent from our understanding of adult literature. The richest children's literature continues, like fairy tales and the Alice books, to offer adult readers, too, their own pleasures. Adult enjoyment of children's literature opens the way, in turn, for fantastic adult fables like George Orwell's Animal Farm. Why have we come to associate the fantastic so strongly with children's literature? Commercial children's literature emerged with the idea of children as a distinct market. In the 18th century, children were still considered adults in training. In the famous painting by Gainsborough, The Blue Boy, the painted subject, although a boy, has the haughty pose and expensive clothes of a wealthy, albeit small, man. In Charles Perrault's version of Little Red Riding Hood, in the end of the 17th century, Red remains eaten. She doesn't get out of the wolf. And the moral warns children, especially well-bred young ladies, against various kinds of wolves. Even when the Grimm brothers collected tales that they knew were told to children, their books at the beginning of the 19th century were intended for adults. The power of the fantastic to teach adults was still accepted into the Romantic period, as we see with cautionary novels like Frankenstein from 1818. But as realism came to seem more fit for adults, as in Pride and Prejudice, 1813, the fantastic was ever more relegated to supposedly uncritical children. Heinrich Hoffmann, who lived for most of the 19th century, wrote and illustrated Struvelpeter, 1845, as a new kind of children's book. It was, in fact, the most popular children's book after Alice until the 20th century. Mark Twain translated it into English for his own children. Hoffman, no relation to E.T.A. Hoffman, was a doctor and the admired director of a lunatic asylum specializing in the care of troubled children. He shared in the growing view that children do not think logically. Naturally, books with morals like the good child must be truthful were ineffective. His gruesome, fantastic cautionary tales like the story of the thumbsucker, in which a boogeyman tailor shears off the child protagonist's thumbs, aim to teach by fantastic shocking. This is Twain's translation. Conrad cried his mama dear, I'll go out, but you stay here. Try how pretty you can be, till I come again, said she. Docile be and good and mild, pray don't suck your thumb, my child. For if you do, the tailor will come and bring his shears and snip your thumb from off your hand as clear and clean as if paper it had been. Before she turned to the south, he'd got his thumpkin in his mouth. Bang! There goes the door, kerslam! Whoop! The tailor lands, kerblam! Waves his shears and heartless grub, and calls for a dolman lucherbub. Claps his weapon to the thumb, snips it square as head of grum, and while that lad his tongue unfurled and fired a yell, heard round the world. Who can tell the mother's sorrow when she saw her boy the morrow? There he stood, all steeped in shame, and not a thumpkin to his name. My goodness, this was a man admired for his sensitive care of children. As the Victorian period advanced, 
children of wealth did not work, but were schooled. The privileged ones were allowed fantasies with more gentle morals. Alice in Wonderland was drafted for a real seven-year-old. Although it is playful and allows Alice ultimately to win, adult readers see its darker side, as when the Queen of Hearts shouts, Off with her head! But of course, in Alice's book, while the adults see that happen, that is, see the Queen yell, the children know that Alice doesn't lose her head. The Tale of Peter Rabbit, at the very beginning of the 20th century, published by Beatrix Potter, aimed to please a five-year-old. Unlike the published Alice, it did not aim at adults. Small but disobedient Peter evades the dangerous Farmer McGregor. Back home, his mother does not scold Peter. <clears throat> Pardon me. She comforts him with chamomile tea. A child needn't think logically to learn the moral. Whether or not children think logically, they certainly can understand literature subtly. The classic tale, Good Night Moon, published by Margaret Wise Brown in 1947, has a bunny protagonist in a room hung with pictures. The old lady is trying to put the protagonist to sleep. He is a bunny, she is a rabbit, and the pictures all make literary allusions. In other words, the illustrator accepts the idea that children can think, if not logically, in some sophisticated way. One of the pictures shows a cow jumping over the moon. Another picture shows three bears sitting in a room. In a later picture in the book, Good Night Moon, we see a close-up of that picture of the three bears. And we notice that in the room in which the three bears sit, there is hung a picture. And that picture is the same picture of the cow jumping over the moon that's in the little bunny's room. In other words, we have an interesting problem of a regress further and further into the world of fiction upon fiction. This is a sophisticated kind of storytelling, and children's books, although they may not suppose that children think logically, certainly understand that they can think critically. When I, as an adult, first read Good Night Moon, I was rather shocked by a picture it shows of a mother rabbit, or an adult rabbit at any rate, standing in a stream in waders and fly fishing, trying to catch, it seems, a baby rabbit, a bunny, that goes leaping out to catch the bait at the end of the line, a carrot. I thought, my goodness, this is cannibalism. What kind of thing is that to put in a children's book, especially a sweet little children's book, aiming to have the child go to sleep? This picture is in the, the in Good Night Moon. It hangs on the wall of the bunny. As I mentioned to my class that I couldn't understand the cannibalism involved, the next day one of my students came to me and said, Ah, you were alive at the wrong time. Take a look at this. In 1942, five years before the publication of Good Night Moon, Margaret Wise Brown had published The Runaway Bunny. The Runaway Bunny itself was a bestseller, and in it, a mother rabbit is trying to bring her runaway baby back into the safety of her own home. In order to attract the bunny, she does all sorts of things, including using a fishing rod to lay a carrot out in front of the bunny's path. This isn't cannibalism. This is love. My student caught the literary allusion that I had missed. But in 1947, a child reading Goodnight Moon would have caught the 1942 reference to Runaway Bunny. In other words, children's literature, whether or not it's based on the notion that children think logically, can be quite sophisticated. The beloved books of Dr. Seuss, pseudonym for Theodore Seuss Geisel, train the imagination. One that I particularly like is called If I Ran the Zoo. On the first page of If I Ran the Zoo, we see 
young Gerald McGrew in the lower left-hand corner, looking at the closed-eyed, quite complacent zookeeper standing in front of the corner of the cage that has a lion in it, and the lion is himself sleeping quite happily with a grin on his face. It says, It's a pretty good zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, and the fellow who runs it, runs it seems proud of it, too. And then what happens, double spread page by double spread page, is Gerald McGrew imagining ever more fantastic ways to make this zoo better, to have ever more fantastic creatures, to have ever more fantastic architecture, and periodically, as the zoo becomes ever more extraordinary, imaginative, fantastic, larger and larger crowds of people pay homage to the wonder that has been created by Gerald McGrew. In addition to that, we see that the capturing act is not merely imagination, but imagination that runs in every direction that the child can think of. I'll capture one tiny, I'll capture one cute, I'll capture a deer that no hunter would shoot, a deer that's so nice he could sleep in your bed, if it weren't for those horns he has on his head. And that sudden move back to the practical, that move from one world to the other, makes us remember just how fantastic this all is. Another way that Dr. Seuss makes us remember how fantastic the world is, is by creating pictures that themselves are fantastic. My favorite among all of these wonderful illustrations is one that shows a family of elk. They have horns that are interconnected, wildly shaped horns, and when you look at the picture, it looks like a tangle of horns. You can't resist taking your finger and trying to trace out the way the horns connect to see, in fact, if his horns are or her, or hers or the other way around. But when Gerald has completely finished with his imagining, he doesn't need to change the world. He's happy now simply to know he can do it. And the very last page of the book shows the identical scene with identical fi fi features on each of the three characters' faces, that is Gerald, the zookeeper, and the lion, the only difference being that within the cage we now have a bright, vivid, colored background. Now the world, even the ordinary world, looks different to Gerald, and he says, Yes, that's what I'd do, said young Gerald McGrew. I'd make a few changes if I ran the zoo. Now what we know, of course, is that these books intended for children are not intended to get children to go running out and changing the zoo. They are intended to get children to think that the possibility of exercising their imaginations will make it possible for them to make a better world in the future. The world of children is a world that can play as actively as can that of adults. The Phantom Toll Booth by Norton Juster, published in 1961, is often considered to be the very best book in the line of Alice in Wonderland, published ever, anywhere, after Alice in Wonderland. Juster himself is primarily an architect, but he's written a few books, and this is by far his child's masterpiece. It is so clever, in fact, that even adults can enjoy it. The moral, however, is simply that education is good. And a, a moral that most adults feel is perhaps too young for them, but it whispers throughout the work rather than blaring at the end. It's the story of Milo, who is a bored young boy, comes home from school and finds a package that he'd never noticed before. He opens it up, and it is, in fact, a model of a toll booth, a large thing that he can construct, and he drives through it with his little toy car. Suddenly, he's in a completely different world. And in that different world, things have metaphorical meanings. That is, as in Freud's The Uncanny, the metaphorical becomes literal. He, for instance, is stuck in a swamp, and his car won't go at all. The swamp is called the doldrums. It's killing him that he can't get out of there, but finally he gets distracted by something else. And when he gets distracted, he just sits glumly, and the car starts up because it goes without saying. His guardian, his mentor on this trip, is a watchdog 
named Tock, who has a large watch in his side. In fact, the book is full of puns. The kingdom in which he enters, the land beyond, is divided into two, one ruled by King Azaz, A-Z-A-Z, -A -Z, the unabridged, and one, the mathematician. In the world, in the land of King Azaz, the unabridged, everything depends upon words. In the world of, in the realm of the mathematician, everything depends upon numbers. The book clearly describes for us that there, the world has two realms, words and numbers. Once upon a time, when I was a much younger man, I was lecturing about this book in a class, and I pointed out to my class how wonderful was the distinction made between words and numbers. That particular day, my son, who was then about four, was sitting in the front row, and he raised his hand. The fact that there were 200 university students sitting behind him made no difference whatsoever, and I called on him from the stage, and David said, but daddy, numbers are words. And he was completely correct. David's insight makes us understand that the phantom toll booth is not for illiterate children. It is for people who have already entered into the world defined by the symbol systems that we learn in school. It is a fantasy for those who are in school, but like Milo, can't wait to get out of school, but it teaches them why they should be in school. They learn, for example, about the enormous powers of words. At, in the chapter called The Royal Banquet, Milo presents himself before a king, who looks at him and says, what an ordinary little boy you are, when it turns out he can do nothing but think. Why, my cabinet ministers can do all sorts of things, the king says. The duke here can make mountains out of molehills. The minister splits hairs. The count makes hay while the sun shines. The earl leaves no stone unturned. And the undersecretary, he finished ominously, hangs by a thread. Can't you do anything at all? Of course, what he does do is bring the twin princesses, Rhyme and Reason, back into the kingdom and gets the two brothers, Azaz and the Mathemagician, to reconcile, and all is well in the realm, in the lands beyond. When Milo gets back to his apartment, he understands he could return to the lands beyond, but as he looks around his room and sees all the books and all the things to play with that previously had bored him so, he realizes he may never have time to go there again because his world is full, Phil, because his world is filled with possibilities. These are truly children's books. What makes children's books children's books? It seems to me that in this new publishing category that begins in the middle of the 19th century of illogically thinking but nonetheless sophisticatedly feeling and noticing children, what we seek is a certain kind of simplicity. Characters. A typical hero of a child's book is a child or an animal. The relationships are among children and or animals and or with a parent figure, just as Juster's talking watchdog talk serves as a parent figure giving guidance to Milo. And unlike adults-only literature, in children's books, the child character typically has full autonomy. It's a rare book for adults only in which children really have the power of decision, of affecting the world. Rather, they become encumbrances or someone to be saved or someone to come up with a clever idea but the real action the real decisions are made by adults not so in children's books there they're made by children or animal protagonists these are though simpler characters they are not for example buffeted by political and large social concerns or the urgings of sexuality in plot Children's books are also simpler than typical adult books. 
What that means is that they are often episodic. Each piece of the story can, in a sense, be thought of as self-contained, one strung after the other, like pearls on a necklace. Clearly, the plot is goal-directed. The child needs to get home again or bring rhyme and reason back together again. The desire here is usually attributed to a single motivation, and it is susceptible, this problem, to a happy ending, what Tolkien calls in his discussion of fairy tales, consolation. The themes of children's literature are also simple, typically embodied, as I say, in a single problem susceptible to permanent and often didactic solution. As with Cinderella, for example, not only do we learn the theme of diligence, but we also see that if there are issues like sex or society that are relevant to the story, they are not typically discussed explicitly. The style is also simple in children's books. Simple in the sense that it uses a restricted vocabulary. So we find often that the language is cute or periphrastic, the long way around saying something. This language, children's, liter children's styles, can employ verse and nonsense thematically. We saw the verse in Alice in Wonderland. We see nonsense in Juster. Or they can employ, that is children's books, language just for fun as in Fred Gwynn's series of books beginning with The King Who Reigned, the cover illustration of which shows a king recumbent as a cloud with rain coming down from below him. There's nothing much to be made of that pun. The glory is just that there is a pun. Now, in the world of adult literature today, most readers do not favor poetry. For better or for worse, most readers see poetry today as falling into two camps. There is the greeting card camp of poetry, in which we understand it to be simple, saccharine, and dutiful, although sometimes we need its help. And there is literary poetry, the kind typically published in journals with very small circulations read by other people who write literary poetry. Most readers think that poetry is simply too intentionally arcane for them or beneath their literary consideration. But in children's literature, poetry is allowed because with the simple vocabulary, the joy of rhyming, the joy of meter comes across. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? We don't look at this as a mistake. We look at this as a beauty. The suspension of disbelief that allows actors in the American musical to break into song seems to have disappeared from modern literature for adults. But for children, it's there. So we have these four levels of narrative that conserve diachronic meaning. Character, plot, theme, and style. And all four of those continue to be simple in children's literature. And when they are reversed, we see that that generates the fantastic. But there's a fifth characteristic of children's literature that separates it from adult literature, and that is format. If you ask an adult, have you read Moby Dick? And the answer is yes, you will never follow up by asking, and did you read it in the large type edition or one with an orange cover or with Boldoni type? You'll just say, ah, you read Moby Dick. But... Can you imagine reading a Dr. Seuss book in a tiny nutshell library edition? It wouldn't be the same book. In children's literature, format matters. The visual matters. The clearest sign of this is that in children's literature, the visuals are where they belong in the text. In adult books, we often might have illustrations gathered together in a central section of color plates. You'd never see that in children's literature, because to tell the story depends upon engagement with the visuals. Run your finger across those horns of the family in Dr. Seuss's book. Now, once we recognize that the visual really matters, suddenly we understand something that adult literature has lost. The visual is part of how we communicate. 
as you read through the book. A children's book will go from the visual to the textual, back and forth, telling the story diachronically. So even though we may come to think of visuals as synchronic, as they are used in children's literature, they add a fifth level of diachronic meaning to the work. And so the changes from one to the other create the fantastic, as with young Gerald McGrew, who goes from the ordinary Gerald to the ever more extraordinary Gerald, so that at the end, when he's the ordinary Gerald again, that's yet one more fantastic change. Just like Alice saying, which way, which way, and being surprised that she doesn't grow because she's gotten used to growing. Now, adults are supposed to have outgrown children's literature. And yet, they still use it for at least four reasons. First of all, adults may enjoy children's literature on its own terms, either as nostalgia or, frankly, as when I was shown Runaway Bunny by one of my students, as a new and delightful discovery. Secondly, some children's books, like the Alice books, are also clearly adult books. The adult reader sees the defense against mortality that runs throughout in a very bitter way. The Alice books that the child misses entirely. Thirdly, there are some authors, like Edward Gorey, for example, who use children's literature as a way of commenting upon children. For instance, he has a famous work called The Gashly Crumb Tinies. This work concerns, this work is just an ABC book, you know, A is for Alice, etc., etc. Well, this book shows a school teacher holding an umbrella with 24 chil 26 children around her. And then we have 26 pages, each with a poem or, and a plate. A, or actually a line and a plate. A is for Amy, who fell down the stairs. B is for Basil, assaulted by bears, etc. Every single one of these illustrations shows a child gruesomely dying. The last one is Z is for Zilla, who drank too much gin. And the last page of all shows the skeletal figure of death holding an umbrella with 26 tombstones around him. It's a children's book, but it's a children's book for an adult who wants to say something about children. I'll leave it to you to decide what Edward Gorey is saying. The fourth reason that adults may use children's literature is that children's literature, because it depends upon simplicity of story, plot, character, and theme, implies to its readers that it is legitimately simple. That means that if one writes in the form of children's literature, one can sneak an oversimple treatment of a subject before an adult consciousness. A clear example of this is George Orwell's Animal Farm, a beast fable that criticizes communism and has in it such foolish lines as, all animals are equal, but some of them are more equal. In fact, Orwell understands that adult readers would never take the politics of Animal Farm as a cogent analysis of the weaknesses of communism, but to get across the fact that communism is caught in its own hypocrisies and creates unbearable social situations, the beast fable of Animal Farm was in fact much more effective than all of the treatises that you can no longer name because they have fallen out of our consciousness. In short, children's literature works for adults because they like it on its own terms. Sometimes it's intended for them. It may be a way to comment on children, and it allows us to say things we could not openly say to other adults. Children's literature allows people with minds still shaping and indulging in imagination 
to go in places they never would have gone were they not encouraged by this use of language and pictures. And adults use it too. Children's literature, in other words, nurtures the fantastic for readers of all ages.